Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Julie Oliver and she's a dog. In my last video, I covered some of the science mistakes made by Ivermectin fans, but there were simply too many for one video. So this is part two. If you missed part one, I'll put a link in the comments. So without further ado, let's go back to the science and have a look at a few more mistakes made by Ivermectin fans. The next mistake is one that I see everywhere in the comments sections of YouTube videos in testimonials on pro ivermectin websites and in interviews with doctors treating patients. And that is confusing anecdotes with data. So many people think because they took ivermectin and then they got better, they must have been cured by ivermectin. What these people fail to consider is that most people who get COVID will get better. This chart comes from Our World in Data and shows the average case fatality rate for COVID across the world. Obviously, as the pandemic has continued, this rate has reduced because we have got better at treating patients. And this includes using dexamethasone, monoclonal antibodies and supplementary oxygen. Now, it's important to note that the case fatality rate is based on the number of identified cases and the number of identified fatalities. And both of these numbers will be underestimates. So the numbers are not entirely accurate. What is very clear, though, is that although the average case fatality rate is unacceptably high at around 2%, most people do survive COVID. So it's not surprising that some people get better after taking ivermectin because they were gonna get better anyway. And of course, people who take ivermectin and then die from COVID can't talk about it because sadly they are dead. Now, the next science mistake is almost like anecdotes on steroids. And this mistake is confusing correlation with causation, or in other words, ignoring confounding factors. One of the most famous examples of this is taught in nearly every introductory statistics course. And that is the correlation between ice cream and drownings. If you don't think about it too much, you could assume that eating ice cream causes people to drown, but that ignores the confounding factor of weather. On hot sunny days, people are more likely to buy ice cream and they are also more likely to go swimming. So the more likely reason for the correlation is that they are both correlated with the weather. There are so many examples of people making this science mistake that it is hard to know where to start. But the one that I see most often is people claiming that COVID cases are currently zero in Uttar Pradesh because they used ivermectin. So let's look at that. So this chart shows recorded COVID cases in Uttar Pradesh over time. Now, the first thing to note is that, in fact, the cases aren't actually zero. But yes, they are quite low. So when exactly did they start using ivermectin? Back in August 2020. Now, if we look at what happened to the cases after that time, it seems a little strange that anyone would think that ivermectin was responsible for the cases now being so low. As you can see, the second wave commenced long after ivermectin was introduced. If ivermectin is the reason for cases now being close to zero, why did they see such a huge increase in cases while they were using it? But let's ignore that for the moment and have a look at what Uttar Pradesh did do during the second wave. You may not be surprised to find that they didn't just give everyone ivermectin. A statewide lockdown, curfews, contact tracing, isolation and mask mandates were also implemented, all tried and true methods for controlling outbreaks. Furthermore, those who did receive ivermectin received it as part of a kit, which also contained a number of other items and medications, including doxycycline, vitamin D, vitamin C, vitamin B, zinc and paracetamol, together with a thermometer and pulse oximeter. And by monitoring their oxygen levels, they were able to transfer people to hospital as soon as their levels fell below 90%, thereby improving their chances of survival. Why would people ignore the majority of the kit's contents and attribute all outcomes to ivermectin? I don't know either. Finally, it is worth mentioning that there appears to be significant undercounting of both cases and deaths in Uttar Pradesh. Indeed, some districts have reported no deaths from any cause for multiple consecutive months, which is, of course, not credible. 
Sero prevalence studies show that over 70% of the population of Uttar Pradesh have SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, either from natural infection or vaccination. The herd immunity achieved from this is a much more likely reason for the current reduction in cases. Now, I know I just said finally, but one more thing. On the 23rd of September, the Indian Council of Medical Research removed ivermectin from their recommendation list of treatments for COVID. In doing this, they joined the Indian Health Ministry, the Indian Clinical Infectious Diseases Society and other Indian medical bodies in not recommending ivermectin for COVID. Hardly the expected behaviour of peak medical and research organisations if ivermectin was working. As we covered in part one, there is one and only one way to adequately assess whether a treatment works. And that is with a well-controlled randomised trial. In this type of trial, participants are randomised to receive either the treatment or a placebo. And neither the participants nor those providing the treatment knows who is getting what. Some of these trials have been completed and have shown no benefit for ivermectin. Some of these trials show the benefit and have since been shown to be fraudulent. And there's more details on this in part one. And there are still some trials underway. This brings me to the next science mistake made by ivermectin fans, which is cherry picking of data. According to ivermectin fans, trials showing no benefit for ivermectin and those still underway have been designed to fail because they are using doses that are too low. So let's compare the doses used in trials that show no benefit for, for ivermectin with the doses used in trials previously touted by ivermectin fans. This shows the doses of ivermectin and treatment duration in a number of trials that have showed no mortality benefit, as well as two trials touted by ivermectin fans as evidence of its efficacy. The doses used in the trial showing no benefit range from 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, and the duration range from two to five days. For the trials touted by ivermectin fans, the dose range is also 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams per kilo of body weight and the duration range from one to four days. So this dose is accepted if the trials support the fans' argument but are claimed to be too low in trials that show no benefit. Of course, as we now know, the two trials that were previously touted by ivermectin fans as showing a mortality benefit for ivermectin have been shown to be fraudulent. This means that there are currently no randomised controlled trials showing a mortality benefit for ivermectin. One more thing worth mentioning is that, according to the results of the NIE study, a single dose of ivermectin is more effective than multiple days dosing. This is in direct contrast to the claims being made by ivermectin advocates. One of the reasons that higher doses aren't used in ongoing trials is because of tolerability issues. And this has been shown quite clearly in a recent study. Here it is. It's currently a preprint with the Lancet, which means it got through the initial screening by the editor, but has not yet been peer reviewed. In this study, patients who had tested positive for COVID were randomised to receive either placebo or one of two doses of ivermectin for five days. The ivermectin doses were either 0.6 or 1.2 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, which is either three or six times the currently approved dose. Amongst patients receiving the higher dose, over 34% discontinued treatment owing to side effects and 70% experienced vision problems. At the lower dose, over 46% experienced vision problems. Importantly, even at these higher doses, no benefit was seen for ivermectin. Indeed, the only patients who subsequently required hospitalisation were in the ivermectin arms. And that brings me to the next size mistake made by ivermectin fans, misunderstanding safety data. According to ivermectin fans, everyone should be using ivermectin because it's incredibly safe. Who cares if it doesn't work? As evidence of this, they point to the low number of adverse events for ivermectin in Vigibase, which is an international database of adverse events. Often they will also compare the number of events for ivermectin with another medication generally considered safe. Now, just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that ivermectin isn't safe, but comparing adverse events on Vigibase proves nothing. Let me explain. Firstly, the most commonly used dose of ivermectin is 0.2 milligrams per kilogram of body weight administered once per year. And most ivermectin fans are advocating for higher and longer dosing than this. Secondly, the majority of ivermectin is used in developing countries, but these countries contribute very little data to the Vigibase system. 
This means most adverse events for ivermectin aren't actually recorded in the Vigibase system. Thirdly, the safe drugs that ivermectin is compared with have much greater usage in ivermectin. So obviously, if more doses are given, the total adverse events will be higher. Fourthly, safety in treating parasites doesn't automatically translate to safety in treating COVID because the effect of COVID on the body is different than the effect of parasites. For example, the inflammation that often accompanies COVID could potentially affect the blood-brain barrier, allowing ivermectin to enter the central nervous system, which would not be good. Now, just to repeat, I am not saying that ivermectin isn't safe as a COVID treatment. I am saying there isn't sufficient data, particularly at higher doses. Now, if any ivermectin fans have bothered to watch this far, you are no doubt shouting at the screen and pounding on the keyboard, telling me that it's been proven safe at 10 times the approved dose. So let's have a little look at that claim. So this is a study and it was published in the Journal of Clinical Pharmacology. Now, they did indeed assess the safety and tolerability of ivermectin, but there are two important things to note. Firstly, as stated in the title, it was assessed in healthy adult subjects, not subjects with COVID or any other infection. And secondly, the total number of subjects who received 10 times the approved dose was only 12. Now, the safety results for these 12 people were fine, so it's a good start but it's nowhere near enough people to draw a definitive conclusion. The final science mistake that I would like to cover in this video is dismissing science with conspiracy theories. And there are several versions of this, but it's usually something about ivermectin being suppressed because it's a cheap medication that big pharma can't make money from because it's off patent. Now, this science mistake can be dismissed with one word, dexamethasone. Dexamethasone is a cheap off-patent medication that has been proven to reduce mortality in COVID patients. Big Pharma didn't try to suppress it. It's been used with good success. And guess what? The company selling it will be making a profit because you don't need a patent to make a profit. You just need to sell your goods at a higher price than it costs to make them. Interestingly, though, some of the people suggesting conspiracies to suppress ivermectin are themselves profiting from their stance. Indeed, one particular advocate who has published a number of papers supporting the use of ivermectin has actually filed a patent for a triple therapy using ivermectin as a COVID treatment. I kid you not. A number of advocates are also asking for donations on their websites and some are even selling ivermectin t-shirts, which I guess are more comfortable than tinfoil hats. Now you'll find links to what I've referenced in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. And if you'd like to see more videos in the future, please hit the subscribe button.